Thank you, Mark, and thank you all for coming out. Before I get started, I want to just touch upon some preliminary matters because I realize that some of you are from Theology 110, and so you'll be interested in signing in on the way out. So we're not going to pass around the attendance sheet just yet, but be sure to sign it on the way out, and that way we'll know. Also, I want to thank Mark Daly, not only for the fine introduction, but also for his leadership. As Vice President of Operations, he's only been with us for a few months, and yet the leadership and the direction that he has given to us is quite remarkable. And so before I begin this brief evening presentation, I would also like to extend to all of you a sort of personal invitation to visit us as soon as the St. Paul Center opens. Now, you can know what building it is. It's at the bottom of the hill, our headquarters, at long last, after 22 years, 25,000 square feet on two acres, and the land was sold to us by the university for half of what they purchased it for, and then they knocked off another quarter of a million as a sign of our partnership. And so we're so grateful to be affiliated with Franciscan and have been now for all of our years. We have over 50 full-time co-workers. They're the single most gifted team, zealous as well. Many of them are graduates of this university, including Mark. And so I want you not only to come down to see our headquarters when it's open within the next month or two, but I also want you to learn more about this because as I mentioned, a lot of former graduates who have gone on have come back, like Mark and his wife and kids. And so you never know where exile might take you. All right, let's begin together in a word of prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your eternal Son, our Savior, our King, and our Lord. And in the name of Jesus, we ask you once again to pour out the Holy Spirit upon us, to illuminate our minds with the light of your truth, the truth of your word, but also to enkindle our hearts with the fire of your holy love, the fiery passion that you wish to communicate to us and through us to others. So help us this evening and hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to begin the presentation the same way I begin the book, by quoting from our first Pope, St. Peter, in his first epistle. From 1 Peter chapter 1, the opening verses, we read the first encyclical. To the exiles of the dispersion, chosen and destined by God the Father, and sanctified by the Holy Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So who is Peter writing to? To the exiles of the dispersion. Now obviously we recognize that his audience is principally Christians, but why use that language? Well, for one thing, it would certainly resonate with the Jews who had become Christians, but would also be familiar with the Gentiles who had been baptized and been joined to the body of Christ. Because the idea of the dispersion, in the Greek the term is diaspora. It actually has become an English loan word. So, what does it mean? Well, it is the dispersion, but it also means in the Greek, sowing, as in seed, scattering, as in the people of Israel. But what we discover through the prophets is that God allowed these calamities to, de to befall his people, the 12 tribes of Israel, repeatedly, precisely for the purpose of creating a kind of centrifugal spirituality. So that instead of simply inviting people to come up to Jerusalem, our earthly capital, and to the beautiful temple that Solomon constructed, 
we were actually discovering that God's purpose and plan was to send the 12 tribes of Israel out to the nations. So the idea of go therefore and make disciples of all nations is not a novelty, though we associate it with the New Testament. It really was embedded in the calling of God when he first brought Israel out of Egypt. They arrived at Sinai, and what does he declare? If you hear my voice and you keep my covenant, you'll be a nation, but a holy nation. You'll be a kingdom, but a kingdom of priests, not politicians and soldiers. So the purpose of God that was there in the old is still the same in the new. And so the idea that we are in exile, that we are dispersed, as it were, for the purpose of serving like leaven in a loaf of bread. This is something that is not sort of an exception. Wow, the people of God are in exile. We think of it that way, and most likely they did too, because they all wanted to be like the Gentiles. Make Israel great again, right? They had caps back then, mega. No, they didn't, but. <laughs> But this idea of wanting to be a nation, more than a holy one, and a kingdom, but not of priests, this was the temptation that they faced throughout their history. I have a timeline up here. I'm not going to bother going through it. But if you look at the calling that God gave to Abraham around 2000 BC, you'll discover that the people of God were uprooted. They were sort of exiles. They were dispersed. They were sojourners for over three quarters of their history. And why? Because God just couldn't get it together? No, because our ways are not his ways. And Israel's ways were not always the Lord God's ways. And let's face it, I think the temptation would be for us to say God's ways are not our ways. But if we were really honest, we'd say God, God's ways are weird. They are. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable are his ways, St. Paul declares. In other words, who to thunk it? I mean, nobody would imagine that God's plan would unfold in the way that it did. Not even Jesus' disciples. When this stranger on the road to Emmaus asked these two, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things before entering into his glory? And they must have been half tempted to say, you're out of your mind. No. What would be necessary would be the, for the enemies of the Messiah to do all of the suffering. So this is more than counterintuitive, but it's been the characteristic feature of God's ways throughout the entirety of the Old Testament, and guess what? For the last 2,000 years of the New as well. So Peter is addressing Christians, but he's tapping into something, something ever ancient and ever new. That we don't get home when we arrive as pilgrims in time for Passover, climbing up the, the great Mount Zion, singing the Psalms of Ascent as we ascend into Jerusalem and enter into the temple. That is a scale model, almost like a dollhouse, like my dad built for my, for my sister when she was young. So what is real is what is eternal. But what do we do in time? What do we do with earthly matter? Well, this is what the talk is all about. This is what the lesson of exile is all about as well. But let's just press pause for a moment and reflect upon the fact that this disruption that occurred. You have David as king for 40 years. Then you have his son Solomon reigning for 40 years. And that's like the golden age. That would be almost the Israelite equivalent of Camelot and all of the Arthurian legends. But it didn't even last a century. As soon as Solomon died, the kingdom was divided. You have a civil war that was never resolved. And so, once again, you have to take a closer look and realize that when God sent the Assyrian Empire attacking the north, whether it was Shalmaneser, Tiglath-Pileser, Sargon II, you just realize that wave upon wave of these Assyrian terrorist armies brought about the initial dispersion, first in 733, then in 722, and 10 out of the 12 tribes of Israel are dispersed, scattered like so many seeds. And then later, Nebuchadnezzar brings Babylon down to the kingdom of Judah. And Jerusalem is destroyed in 587. 
the temple is not only demolished, but desecrated. Now, it's hard for us to imagine, and yet, in the last 20 days, what have we been reading about, hearing about? The missiles, the thousands of missiles that came from Gaza and struck Israel. Hundreds of Jews, and we pray and we hope that this bloodshed will end, but there really is no sign that it will, and yet what goes around comes around. You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But suppose what we discovered, say, next year, was that there was a strike on Rome attacking the Vatican. What? That's unthinkable. Upon this rock I will build my church. Well, think again. The idea that the church is primarily located in Rome, within the Vatican, that St. Peter's Basilica is really what Jesus was talking about. Are you ready for what we mistakenly identify as our temple to be demolished and desecrated? I'm not a prophet, I'm not the son of a prophet, but I know history well enough to recognize that most of us aren't ready. We would not only be shocked, we would be challenged by a temptation to unbelief. I hope it doesn't happen, but don't be entirely shocked into atheism or unbelief if it does. Jesus says, on this rock I will build my church, and then he goes on to give them the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Because right now in the 21st century, things have changed in ways that nobody saw coming. Now, you probably hear this more from your parents than you do your roommates, because most of you are less than a quarter of a century old. But if you were as old as I was, I think you'd look back and realize that even the people who were described as being gloom and doomers didn't predict that things would go this, this, this bad. You know, with regard to marriage, with regard to family, with regard to gender issues, and so much more. My point is not to instill within any of us a sense of gloom and doom. But I do want to point out the fact that this is normal. This is not unusual. And so don't give in to the temptation that many Catholics I know fight, and that is to kind of lapse into nostalgia. That is, oh, the Arthurian legends of the Golden Age, the pre-conciliar Catholic Church in America back in the 50s. And I'm not mocking people who long for those days. I get it. Archbishop Fulton Sheen on primetime TV, winning Emmys, and actors like Bing Crosby longing to play the part of a priest in the bells of St. Mary. And I remember when I was teaching in Joliet, Illinois, before we moved here to Steubenville, the Franciscan sisters that we worked alongside of were graduates of the local Franciscan high school and all of the girls who graduated. They had for like 10 years in a row between 30 and 50 high school graduates enter the convent until it was bursting at the seams. And all of that just looks so ideal. But let's not romanticize this because just like Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. Just when we think we're basically indomitable, unstoppable, that's when things get shaken. Other people like Father Walsh go even further back. He's written a book that's in our library, the 13th century, the greatest of all centuries. And no wonder, because you have St. Thomas Aquinas, you have St. Bonaventure teaching at the same university there in Paris. Can you imagine signing up for classes in the spring semester? You can't decide. You know, Thursday at 2.15, you're going to either have Bonaventure or Aquinas. I mean, talk about a glory age. And yet, they would tell us what Scripture tells us, and that is they were in exile as well. And so this condition is not unusual, and yet what is so easily succumb to, and that is the sense that we just want to get home. And what do we mean by home? Well, where we go over fall break for Thanksgiving. You know, our return address, our home phone number, or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. But just recognize that God allows things to happen to his people, not in spite of his love, but because of it. We're willing to settle for so much less than what he wants for us. So I want you to imagine what it would have been like 
to be alive at the time that Nebuchadnezzar began to bring divisions of soldiers, his troops coming to Judea, surrounding Jerusalem, and then taking thousands of Jews prisoner into Babylonian captivity. What? And the prophet Jeremiah is the one who is the great explicator. I mean, he is the only one who can kind of decode the ways of God because it looks as though, okay, we've broken the covenant lots of ways, but it certainly seems like he's forgotten about it as well. And so Jeremiah is the prophet of the exile. He was still in Jerusalem when the first waves of captives went forth to Babylon, and he wrote a letter. And in this book, we reflect a lot upon the letter of Jeremiah that we find in chapter 29. Some of you probably know Jeremiah 29 because I know various students, professors too, and households have adopted Jeremiah 29 11 as their verse. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. So then you will call upon me and come to pray for me. That's beautiful. Let's just acknowledge, if you have to choose a life verse, you could do worse than Jeremiah 29, 11. But what we tend to ignore is Jeremiah 29, 1 to 10. Because this is found at the climax of a letter, and the letter is written to the exiles, but it's not just written from Jeremiah's personal standpoint. He's delivering an oracle of God, explaining the ways of the Lord for his people. Why is the Lord sending us to Babylon? Okay, we get it, because we've sinned. We've broken the covenant. Jeremiah has made that clear. But the Babylonians aren't going to rehabilitate us. They're not any better. Why should they have the privilege of stomping us when we have not sinned as bad as they have? Well, you're the family of God. You're the sons and daughters. He doesn't love you and hate them, but he wants to use you to reach them. Oh, really? Yeah. And so what we call in this book, Catholics in Exile, is the Jeremiah option. Because what Jeremiah does is to give the exiles seven practical tips. But they're not just like tips like wake up and give thanks for the new day. No, these are seven practical steps to take for the rest of your lives and for the lives of your children. And so what does he say? Well, beginning there, we read in verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. First, build houses and live in them. In other words, get yourselves established. Get to work. Not live in pup tents like your Bedouins. No, build houses and live in them. Don't just rent Babylonian apartments and look for the first opportunity to come back. It's going to be 70 years, as Jeremiah announced. So build houses and live in them. In other words, become oriented towards the future. That's just the first step. The second is plant gardens and enjoy the produce. Now, that's not just in the backyard. The gardens are fields. What the produce would be would be the crop for your family this winter and next. And so get to work, productive labor, fruitful labor, together as a family in a neighborhood in a Babylonian town where you have been taken as prisoners, as captives, as exiles, and yet there is a sense in which you can be at home in Babylon if you know the Lord God Almighty is with you. So build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and enjoy the produce. Third, take wives and have children. In other words, make your family a high priority. This is the path of holiness for those in exile. He doesn't go on to say, and become millionaires and topple the government. No, they're there as leaven in the loaf of bread. They're there to bear witness to the fact that the God of Israel is the God of all nations. So take wives and have children. 
You know, I remember 44 years ago when I graduated from college, I had proposed to the most gorgeous gal on campus. We had worked together in Young Life, reaching out to the local public high school for the last two years together. It was an amazing time of partnership. And I got down on Rainbow Bridge, I got down on my knees and I pulled out the ring and I popped the question. And I'd like to say that in the Gospels, Jesus gave sight to the blind, but that night he clearly took sight away from she who could see. She accepted my proposal. We, we danced across Rainbow Bridge and to celebrate, I took her out to Mr. Donut. I had no money left. That ring was so pricey, you know. But we graduated together. And it was really cool for us to introduce our parents to one another, you know, and, and then they get married that summer after graduation to go off to grad school. And then the Presbyterian pastor at Trinity Presbyterian Church, and that's when everything started to go south. And I found myself in exile, becoming Catholic, jobless, committing professional suicide. What gives? Well, the Lord had his plans for my bride and for me and for our children as well. But that's not all. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. That's the fourth step. I don't know how many of you were at the Bergsma wedding this Saturday. Dr. Bergsma's firstborn, Peter, who's really short. I think he's about 6'8". <laughs> yeah, snow-capped, in fact. He got married to Christine. It was so amazing to see not only his whole family there, but a lot of other families who had graduated from Franciscan University and like Mark, had gone on and come back to raise their families in a rather flourishing Catholic subculture here in a little town in Ohio. And so you're not just getting married and having kids, you're taking wives for your sons and giving your daughters in marriage. Was anybody here at the wedding on Sunday with Maria Powell and also with Christian Labrador. No? Okay. I mean, Father Jonathan St. Andre, as well as, uh, oh, it was just an amazing time. We had about 300, and probably two-thirds of them were students here at Franciscan. And, and Maria, now Labrador, has been this administrative assistant, and really, uh, at the St. Paul Center, her nickname is She Who Must Be Obeyed. <laughs> she graduated with her master's degree. But you can see this future orientation, this family outlook, where you're not only building houses, planting gardens, and having kids, but watching your kids have kids. It's amazing. To have six kids in Steubenville is to have a small to medium-sized family. Okay, we have the 21 grandkids from the first three, and they were all back two weeks ago. I like to say that the town of Steubenville has never had a zoo until two weeks ago. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was wild. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I... Just parenthetically, I should mention this because this is the first I have seen this book. I've been working on children's books, grandchildren's books is what I call them. This just came out tonight. This is my author's copy, The Supper of the Lamb by Scott Hahn and Emily Stimson Chapman. And we dedicated, I dedicated it to the children of all my former students to whom I was blessed to teach the original version, The Lamb's Supper. How many of you have parents who went to Steubenville? to the Franciscan University, okay? So often it's more than just one or two. Uh, but I want to propose that you might want to consider getting married, building houses, planting gardens, having wives and kids and sending them to us as well. But this is who we are. This is why we're here. This is why God allows things to go so wild as it was in Babylon. But again, he has some more. So first build houses and live in them. Second, plant gardens and enjoy the produce. Third, take wives and have children. Fourth, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. Fifth, multiply there and do not decrease. Now we've just had a conference here the last two days on Nostra Aetate, on how Catholics need to respond to the growing anti-Semitism that we see in our country and all around the world. We have to recognize that the Jews in Babylon multiplied there. And like they did in Egypt, they began to grow so quickly that the Egyptians were scared. And this is why the policy of the Pharaoh was to kill all of the Hebrew male children when they were born. 
so that the Israelite girls would have to marry Egyptian men, and then the title to the land would revert to Egypt. And so sometimes following these practical steps can, pro can prove to be threatening to those who are not increasing. And right now, what do we see in America and throughout the West? Depopulation. So we ought to serve as a counterexample. Be fruitful and multiply, raise families, prioritize them, but not just to outnumber, to subvert and to topple that town in Babylon. Number six is to seek the welfare of the city to which the Lord your God has driven you. Do what? Seek the welfare? Well, that is not just socioeconomic policy. The word for welfare is shalom, what we would ordinarily translate as peace, the kind of peace that is not strictly reducible to the absence of conflict, but to the harmony of those who share family life and love as well. And so what I would propose to you as you think about graduation, you'll discover what I discovered. I had three majors, economics, philosophy, and theology. And I had pretty good grades as well. I got some awards and all that stuff. But all of the time, all of the effort, all of the energy that I poured into these three majors ended up paling in comparison to the much greater challenge of getting married, having kids, raising a family. I've known of so many friends who have succeeded in business. They've become wealthy. They've created corporations, CEOs, whatever, but they've neglected their family. And their children have strayed. They've just kind of wandered off. They've lost the faith. They left the values. No matter how successful you are in the external world of work, if you neglect the home, the hearth, you're going to feel miserable. You're going to feel like a failure. Well, to be honest, in raising a family, having six kids at one time, three teenagers, I also felt like a failure. Nothing has frustrated me as much as fathering six kids. Nothing has fulfilled me as much as fathering six kids. And the ratio is not 50-50. Nothing has made me feel like a failure as much as parenting. And I know for a fact that when Jesus says, if anyone should follow me, he must take up his cross daily, that Kimberly has identified her cross. It has a name, Scott. <laughs> and I have a cross named Kimberly. And it's difficult, although mine is much smaller and lighter than hers. But this is putting first things first. This is what Jeremiah was saying. But it isn't like the family is this enclosed circle. We're not Amish Catholics. We pray for the welfare of the city to which the Lord God has driven us. And so eight years ago, what did Kimberly do? After we dropped off our son David, our youngest, after 26 years of homeschooling, we sent him to Gregory the Great at his request, or more like his demand. We drove home, we were praying together on the way back from Scranton, Pennsylvania. What am I gonna do now that I'm not homeschooling for the next three years? I suggested she do a holy hour and pray about running for city council. She looked at me and she said, I'd never expected that from you. I didn't either. <laughs> and so she went to a holy hour and she came back and she said, I do feel a calling. And so she knocked on 7,000 doors in Steubenville. And just for your information, Steubenville has only about 7,000 doors. <laughs> She spent nine months knocking on every house, every apartment, going downtown through the apartments and the government housing as well, just asking, what is on your heart? She was ready to listen, then she was ready to lead. And she has led for the last eight years. We have term limits and so December is the end. And so she's prayerfully discerning what she should do. But I gotta tell you, she was praying for the shalom of the city of Steubenville. Now, we all know the passage in the Gospel of John, you know, can anything good come out of Nazareth, right? I grew up in Pittsburgh. That's what we would say about Steubenville. <laughs> all right, so we ought to be prayerfully concerned and committed, not only about our family and other Catholic families that form our parish family or our diocesan family, but Christ didn't just die for Catholics. He died for every single man, woman, and child in this town. I'm sometimes stunned and disappointed by how little outreach our students do in this fair city. I remember by the time I was finishing up my freshman year in college, 
I wanted to repay a debt of gratitude that I felt like I owed to our Lord because he used a parachurch ministry called Young Life to reach me when I was in juvenile court. I found Christ. He found me. So I couldn't wait to spend three and a half years returning the favor by reaching out to all the troubled teens in the local public high school, Grove City High School. And that's where Kimberly and I teamed up. That's where we both fell in love. So I just say this again to plant a seed because you can also end up discovering that small Catholic colleges can actually create small Catholics. Kind of like, you know, ingrown. Like we're a holy campus up on the hill, which we are, and I'm grateful, but we've got to come down off the hill and reach into that city. Whether it's city council or the Ohio Valley Youth Program that Bobby John has. And I hope you take note of this because Bobby John Bauman is a convert to the Catholic faith. I was privileged to be his sponsor, but he's doing an amazing work with hundreds and hundreds of junior and senior high school kids in this area with all kinds of programs, not just evangelization, but dancing and music and that sort of thing. Pray for the peace, the shalom of the city to which the Lord your God sends you. And number seven, pray. Pray alone, pray together. Pray to the Lord on its behalf and for its welfare that you will find your welfare. Why? For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. So then you will call on me and come to me and pray for me and bring others as well. Now, I need to begin wrapping up. What I'd like to propose is that this actually happened. We don't have many historical records. And no wonder, because in exile, dispersed among the Babylonians or the Assyrians, you don't just have, you know, Jewish publishing houses. You're just getting by. You know, just enough to build a house, to raise a family, to find work, to be fruitful in the town. It's an interesting fact about the Old Testament that like 80% of the Old Testament is written about 20% of their history because the exile is the majority of their history. And we actually have about 5.9% of the Old Testament written about all of these centuries, all of these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews who were carried off into captivity, but they bloomed where they were planted. But we do have one record, and that is the book of Daniel. Because Daniel, as a a young man, I mean, really a boy, was carried off into Babylonian captivity. And Nebuchadnezzar was the one who had demolished the temple, desecrated, destroying Jerusalem. And he was raised in the Babylonian palace of Nebuchadnezzar. Talk about tough circumstances. And what did he do? Well, in the book of Daniel, you will read in the first four or five chapters about how Daniel opened his mind and his heart to the Word of God. And he was given this wisdom that exceeded the sages and the wise men of Babylon. And so Nebuchadnezzar knew that he could consult with Daniel. In fact, Daniel's name means the judgment of God. So the emperor turned to Daniel a lot like the Pharaoh had turned to Joseph. And not only gained wisdom, but then the Jews gained favor from the pagan empire. And not only that, but as you read in Daniel, over and over again, Nebuchadnezzar, little by little, experienced a series of conversions. You might think I'm exaggerating, but no. After Daniel has told the emperor his dreams and then interpreted them, famously, what does Nebuchadnezzar declare? Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and did homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him and to his God. The king said to Daniel, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts while he was probably a teenager or in his early 20s. And then, of course, just like some people backslide, so did Nebuchadnezzar. And so you read about how he 
basically goes into a fury against Daniel's friends and gets the fiery furnace. But as a result of the deliverance of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who all of you know through Veggie Tales, <laughs> what do you have? Well, that deliverance produces an even deeper conversion in the pagan emperor, Nebuchadnezzar. And so what we read is, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will along with the host of heaven. And it goes on and on where he acknowledges that the God of Israel is the God of gods and no one can speak against him or his people. And more recently in our daily masses in the last month or so, we've been hearing about the Lord's anointed. And who is that? Darius, the ruler of Persia. Cyrus also by name. So Cyrus, the ruler of Persia, that conquered Babylon, defeating Nebuchadnezzar, ends up issuing a decree not only to allow the Jews to go back to Judea and rebuild the walls of the city, but the temple as well. And so when Judah is reborn, this is the birth of what we call Judaism. It's not the same thing as the Israelite religion that was established by Moses at Mount Sinai and confirmed by all the 12 tribes of Israel at Mount Zion. No, now it's just the little tribe of Judah, not with a monarch, but a high priest. This is Judaism, as we have it now in the dispersion, because the majority of Jews were still in exile. Thousands came back, but most didn't. And so over and again, generation after generation, building houses, planting gardens, raising families, seeing generations of your children and your grandchildren, seeing the work of God, in the struggle of labor, hard work, where you're praying, but it isn't, you know, encouraged by public authorities. But this is just the Old Testament. And so when Peter is writing his first encyclical, he's addressing Christians who've discovered that when the old is fulfilled by the new, it hasn't really changed our daily life, our practical experience. And so in the new covenant, as in the old, what we discover is that these earthly institutions can be mightily used by God, but he doesn't depend upon them. They depend upon him. And so, think about it. I've heard many people describe what it's like these days in the 21st century. You try to live a virtuous life, and as a result, you're afraid of secular authorities. They might be targeting, you know, homeschool Catholics because they're accused of being what? Domestic terrorists or whatever? I'd encourage you to unplug the cable news networks and get, not get you know, the daily news and the daily news cycle, but get the good news. Because this gospel is so much better than the bad news is bad and the bad news is much worse than we ever could have imagined it would be. But the Catholic gospel delivers sacred mysteries that are not just out of this world, but penetrating this world. Because we don't have to die to go to heaven. All we've got to do is go to Mass. The angels and the saints are there, whether we see them or not. Through the eyes of faith we do, but when John describes the worship of the angels and the saints in heaven, what do they do? They're singing the Holy, 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 the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God, the Gloria. God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven, more in the Mass. And if you go there, you go home. And when you go home, you're in heaven. You got to go back to work but the new covenant is still new after 2,000 years because it's a new and eternal covenant. It doesn't make becoming holy easy. It makes it possible. And so the sacraments are not administered to robots. No, there is no artificial intelligence in the family of God, and there's no shortcut to gaining that wisdom that comes only through facing the challenges, hard work, raising a family, and realizing that this is always going to be a challenge. So what would I say to those who are getting ready to graduate in the next year or three? I would say build houses and live in them. 
plant gardens and enjoy the produce. Enter into the covenant of marriage. Have children. Give your children in marriage to others. And pray for the welfare, the shalom of the city to which the Lord your God sends you. And look for Steubenville alumni. Jeremiah doesn't say that, but <laughs> that's what I would advise. And then when you come alongside of Catholic friends or non-Catholic friends who are decrying how bad everything seems to be getting, I, there's, there's room for agreement. Let's face it, we're outnumbered. And we're surrounded by secularists who want to relativize morality and privatize religion, and we're even infiltrated within our diocese, within our parishes. Wheat and tares, wheat and weeds are going up alongside of each other. So what must we conclude? That there has never been a better time to be a faithful Catholic, and that the sacraments will do what we can't do for ourselves and our loved ones, and that is make us holy. That this isn't pumping up religious rhetoric or exaggerating through a kind of holy hyperbole, this is the truth that we profess every time we stand and recite the creed. Because we believe in God the Father Almighty, who didn't just send his son, but turned sinners into sons and daughters, and then into saints. This is who we are. This is why you're here. And this is why we wrote Catholics in Exile. Because we all want to get home and see the face of our Father, and then behold one another. And after, you know, say, not an hour, but after a billion years, we'll realize that the first minute of eternity has passed. And we'll look back and wonder why this life on earth seems so interminably long and so unendurably difficult. And we'll realize no pain, no gain. I want to conclude with a reading from Pope Benedict. He says this, in the normal way of things, a God who loses his land and his people and lets them be defeated is unable to protect his sanctuary, is a God who has failed and been overthrown. And what he's referring to, the Sumerians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, who all had nationalistic gods to protect our land, to cause us to prosper economically and triumph militarily until we're vanquished and our gods are overthrown. When Israel went into exile, quite astonishingly, the opposite happened. The stature of this God, the way he was completely different from the other divinities in the religions of the world, was now manifest. And the faith of Israel at last took on its true form and stature. He became the God of the nations, the Father of all peoples. This is why we are scattered. And even if we get to Rome on a pilgrimage, even if we get back to Jerusalem and the Holy Land, we're not home until we're in heaven. We're in exile. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, once again, we thank you for the gift of your word. The word that is inspirated on the sacred page of scripture. But above all, the word who became flesh to dwell among us, who still dwells among us in the Holy Eucharist. Feed us, O God, with your word. Give to us that supernatural fuel that will enable us to be a light, to be on fire, to grow in holiness, to overcome weakness, to acknowledge our own weakness so that your strength might be made perfect in our weakness. And once again, we ask you that you would hear us as we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Holy Mary, our hope, seat of wisdom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's take like four or five minutes for Q&A. If you have any questions, I want you to feel free to ask. I should mention that the rest of the book addresses a number of questions. And in particular, what I didn't get to tonight is this. That what bothered Jeremiah, even more than the people of God were now in exile, was when the people of God no longer realized they were in exile. When they had grown so comfortable, they were quite at home in Babylon, and they didn't ever really care to see if Jerusalem and the temple were rebuilt. That's why we have to keep this hope in Kindle. Joseph, you had a question?
Okay, so the question is, what would I say to Catholics who over the last several years have kind of awakened spiritually and now feel themselves alienated not only from the culture but also from within the church, the diocese, the parish, even the universal church? You know, I would say be a Catholic and recognize that the Catholic church is not international, it's not planetary, it's not global, it's Catholic, which means universal. And so where is the church located primarily in its essence and perfection? In heaven, with the angels, the saints, the martyrs, and our loved ones as well. And they don't form an older denomination. They don't form a different church. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. They're the church triumphant. We're the church militant. Sometimes the church somnolent, asleep. You know, and so when we are awakened, we should not be surprised because if we pay attention to Scripture, we're going to discover, you know, you're trying to raise a family and be virtuous and you're afraid of the authorities, not only the secular authorities, but even the ecclesiastical authorities. What am I describing? The holy family in Bethlehem. Where not only Herod is targeting all of the Hebrew male children in that little town, but the priests are complicit. They know that Herod doesn't want to go and worship the Messiah, the baby, Jesus. And so, what else am I describing? Well, Holy Week, when you have secular authorities, Pilate and Herod, complicit with Caiaphas and Annas, the Sanhedrin. The history of Israel is like the history of the Catholic Church. Most of the time, in most places, you have wheat and weeds growing up alongside of each other. And this is how God basically turns sinners into saints. Love your enemy, Jesus said. He never said don't have enemies. He didn't say just love the enemies outside. No, there are no enemies. There are no rivalries like those within a family. Fraternal rivalries are more fierce and intense usually than, you know, between high schools playing football or something. So, you know, I would say wake up and realize how normal life is and then get with the program of becoming a saint and love the Pope. Love your bishop. Pray for him. Can you imagine how bad it would be if I were Pope? <laughs> I had a nightmare you couldn't wake up from, you know? <laughs> and, you know, I would pass a polygraph, you know? I, I know that to be the case. But, you know, the idea that the Pope's teaching is sometimes, you know, we want to receive with obsequium, with that kind of reverent respect. It doesn't mean that everything he says is infallible. We know that popes have taught heresy while they were popes. I mean, Pope John XXII in the 1300s who canonized St. Thomas Aquinas, my favorite theologian, was teaching from his chair, from his pulpit, week after week for months and years, that the disembodied saints cannot see the beatific vision. He was confronted by cardinals who had doubts, who had questions. Finally, on his deathbed, Pope John XXII recanted. So, you know, we think we're so unique. The church has never gone, well, every age is totally unique. The church has never gone through struggles like it did in the 14th century, the Avignon papacy. So become Catholics, get to know your story, get to know the history of our church, and you're going to realize how blessed we are, how grateful we ought to be. And not just for John Paul or Benedict, but for Francis and everyone who came before and afterwards, because they were all sinners. They all went to confession for good reason. So they need our prayers and they need us to love them too. Great question. Yes. Yeah, I would say just going to church and kind of going through the motions, the externals, while you're just kind of living out in the middle of the world, it's like the worst of both worlds. You're going to be miserable as a Catholic because you're not really tapping into the roots. And you're also going to be ineffective in the world as you mimic and as you mirror the, you know, the worldliness all around you. And so I would say throw yourself into a sacramental lifestyle, which doesn't mean becoming monastic. It really means entering more fully into the world because that's where we're called to be. We could be saints in the middle of the world. As lay people, we're called to a kind of holy secularity. We've been brainwashed into thinking that the holy is opposed to the secular. 
No, the holy is opposed to the sin of the world and to secularism. But of all citizens in America, we quote from the epistle to Diognetus that what the soul is to the body, the church in the world is to all of the secular nations. We really are meant to be life-giving. If we're not working to transform the world, the world will transform us. And not just institutionally, but individually as well. And I would say this, that uh, you know, the Catholic Church, the Catholic faith, becoming holy, it's, it's not hard, it's just humanly impossible. We can't do it on our own. And so the supernatural grace that we get in the sacraments is sort of there for us to enter into sacred mysteries that go beyond mere appearances. Bread and wine, oil and water, you've got to be kidding. But what if the faith is true? I mean, even if it were only half as true as we think it is, it would still boil this world to rags if we let it. It would also, I think, purge us of these disordered attachments that we continually tolerate within ourselves. We end up becoming, you know, Catholics, be, but also we become wretched. We, we really are unhappy with ourselves because we continually make excuses. I went to confession last night. I go in Opus Dei weekly. Kimberly has never suggested it's too frequent. She doesn't know what I confess. She just knows when I come back, I'm a kinder and gentler husband and father and all of those things. So the more we plunge into this, the more we allow it to really soak into us, you know, the more we're going to enjoy it. You know, I just met with uh, Bishop Paul Bradley yesterday at Bob Evans for breakfast, and we had a marvelous, marvelous time together. I don't know what was so, did I say it? Did I misspeak? We met for breakfast at Bob Evans? with you know, our new apostolic administrator, the Bishop of Steubenville. I misspeak now that I'm turning 66, so I just didn't catch it there. In any case, at the end of this conversation, as he was expressing his desires for our diocese, he said, there are two words that I love and I long to live, and that is joy and hope. And I'm like, I am paying for his breakfast. <laughs> I needed that. <laughs> You know, I, I, I think what we have to recognize is that we need this grace of ongoing conversion. It's not simply what happened to me when I was 14 or 37 years ago when I entered the Catholic Church. It's what happened about 14 hours ago when I woke up and I made a morning offering and I realized, okay, I'm walking in the flesh, not the spirit. So I began the spiritual reading, the gospels, the rosary, and that kind of thing. And I would also say, and this should come as no surprise to anyone, sacred scripture. We want to hear God open up scripture and listen to him speak. You know, I, I also like to say this, that if you were Jesus and you were abandoned, betrayed, crucified, you died and you were buried and you descended into Hades, and then you came back and on your first day back from the dead, Easter Sunday, what would you put on your to-do list? You know, I would probably drop in on Pilate and Herod the high priest, the Sanhedrin, and just say, I am back, and you have a lot to rethink. What is truth? I am. Yeah. You know, and now comes payback. <laughs> you know, but what I wouldn't do, what none of us would do, I mean, if we compared our to-do list, you know, I'd like to lead a Bible study for hours, walking with these two lowly lay people who won't even recognize me opening up the law and the prophets and the psalms and the writings to show why it was necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory, but not allow them to recognize me until we get to the town of Emmaus, to the table where I take, I bless, I break, and I give them the bread and their eyes are open. And what do I do next? It's about time. No, I vanish. Why? Because through the Old Testament, fulfilled by the new, we recognize Jesus resurrected body, blood, soul, and divinity in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread, and we can't wait to walk or run all the way back to Jerusalem and tell the apostles. And then what does Jesus do on Easter Sunday night? He leads another Bible study with the 11, going through the law and the prophets and the Psalms until their hearts are burning within them and their eyes are open to the resurrected Eucharistic Lord. Clearly, Jesus is suffering from some sort of post-traumatic distress, some syndrome. I mean, he's got his priorities all messed up. But I mean, you would too if you descended into Hades. But what if he doesn't? 
What if his priorities ought to be ours? He wasn't wasting Easter Sunday leading two extensive scripture studies. And it wasn't just because they were Jews back in the first century. Catholics in the 21st century needed every bit as much. I don't exaggerate, not even slightly. And that's why the St. Paul Center you know, has for us become really a kind of mission, a legacy that we not only want to leave for our family and our friends and our co-workers, but also to the university. Teaching here for 33 years is like the thickest slice of heaven I have ever enjoyed. And so it's a little bit of payback, and I really do mean that, and I invite you all to come down and visit us. I didn't mean to end with an advertisement, but you know, <laughs> the headquarters, it's almost done. So any other questions? One more, yeah, okay, two more, we'll stop. Okay, let me, let me restate the question, see if I get it. What would I say to a Protestant who became a Catholic after living in a, a lifelong Catholic who lives in a majority or a dominant Protestant context, now living where? Here in a, in a Catholic majority area. I would just say, you know, when you look back on the separated brothers and sisters that we call Protestants, Instead of fixating on where we diverge, focus on the common ground and be thankful. I am more grateful today for my evangelical Protestant formation than on, on the day I was ordained a Presbyterian pastor. I, I thank God for all of my teachers and all of what I learned because all of that led me to this. And so when I'm in a Catholic context, surrounded by a majority of Catholics, what I wanna do is set the place on fire. Not physically, but spiritually, you know. <laughs> I'm not an arson, but you know, Jesus wanted to set the world ablaze, and so do I, and he began with their heart. Did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures? So I would say take the best of both, put it together, and see what God has in store. Yeah, so you Last by, question. You ended by saying that um, the worst part of exile of Jeremiah was the Jews refusing to believe that they were in exile. Um, and then Well, you know, back then in exile, there wasn't a lot you could do in terms of, let's go up to Jerusalem for Passover. Let's stay for the whole long, the whole week long Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let's get ready to come back in 50 days for Pentecost. And then the seventh month, we'll do all of those feasts as well because the temple is in ruins and the city is demolished. So what do you do? You know, I'm reminded of a Peanuts comic strip. I don't know if anybody you ever seen Peanuts. There was a, a little yellow bird called Woodstock. He had his wings up high one day, and Lucy and Linus are walking by, and Linus explains he believes the sky is falling. And Lucy says, you think you can hold up the sky with those puny little wings? And Woodstock says, one does what one can. <laughs> and I would say that's what the exiles did. They did what they could. And what was that? Not much more than the Sabbath. But notice that there were seven steps, beginning with build houses, live in them, plant gardens, and all of the rest. But what is the seventh? Prayer. And where do you go? The synagogue. And who are you with? The exiles. So if all you can do is the Lord's Day, the Mass, the sacraments, that oasis, that island, is going to not only be the source of life, the wellspring of grace, but it's gonna grow. Multiply, don't decrease. Isn't just true for the families, but the synagogues, the parishes as well. And so I would say the best way to remind yourself that you are in exile, that you are in exile, but that God has blessed us as Israelites more in exile than when like a trickle of Babylonians might come up to Jerusalem as pilgrims to hear the Psalms of Zion. Realize that God is writing straight with crooked lines. We just got to make, make sure that we are in prayer on a regular basis. Six days of hard work is sanctified by one day. So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh you rest. And not just you, but your wife, your sons, your daughters, your manservants, your maidservants. Everyone who listens to the word of God 
ought to be given an equal share of divine rest. And I'm convinced that Pope St. John Paul II saw this on keeping the Lord's Day holy is the single most profound yet neglected of his writings, Dies Domini. It's a program for cultural transformation, not political revolution or subversion, but living in such a way. And I should mention this too because Catholics in Exile is like the third book in a trilogy. It began with a book that I wrote when I finally became an empty nester. I never wanted to write a book on marriage while I was still parenting because it'll come back and bite you. you know? And so when our kids were finally out and they weren't burning down the town, I, I wrote this book called The First Society, The Sacrament of Matrimony and the Restoration of the Social Order. And I begin the book with a, a vignette. My first semester as a PhD student at Marquette studying under this famous Jesuit, Father Donald Keefe, in a doctoral seminar split. We had 10 doctoral students, five Protestants, five Catholics, this was 85, when you had Reagan, when you had John Paul in his youthful vigor, when you had the moral majority, when you had Protestants and Catholics shoulder to shoulder doing pro-life work together for the first time as partners. So the course was called Religion and Society, and we were debating what role, if any, does religion have in the public square in political debate. And the, 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 the class was divided, but it wasn't just Catholic versus Protestant. The Protestants were divided, so were the Catholics as well. And as Father Keefe led the debate, and as he was also trying to get his lecture done, we noticed in this exchange that his eyes were drifting out toward the window. And it got quiet, he was just staring. We thought it was a flying saucer or something, you know? And then he turned around and he said, you know, if Catholics simply live the grace of the sacrament of matrimony for one generation, the result would be a transformed society, regardless of the politicians that we elected and the promises they kept or they broke, as they always break most of them. Oh, but I digress. And I was like, keep digressing. What did you just say? And it felt like a laser beam landed on the back of my retina. It was so illuminating, and yet it was, it burned. It was like, wow, I've never taken that seriously, my own sacrament of matrimony. I was not yet in the church, but I had become convinced that marriage was not only a covenant, but a sacrament. And so I took that home and I shared it with Kimberly and she looks at me and she says, now prove it. I'm like, okay, we will work on this more than we have. This is the first in a trilogy. The second one came out right after the last presidential election entitled, It is Right and Just, Why the Future of Civilization Depends on True Religion. I got so many favorable reviews from the second book, but everybody without fail said, but what do we do with this? Because we're never gonna see the day where America becomes Christian or the Catholic faith becomes the majority report and all of that. And they're right. So I wrote Catholics in Exile with Brandon who was my co-author with It Is Right and Just. And so I wanna encourage you to really study while you're here and not just surf the internet, not just check out Facebook or whatever else. I do find that students these days, even the best and the brightest, are spending far too much time online than they are in the books. In scripture especially, but other books too that will lift your vision and send you forth in a way that is really powerful and effective. I can't begin to tell you how grateful I am for the privilege and the joy of sharing with you tonight. Thank you in turn for your time as well. And may God bless you. And as, as Mark announced, these books are available for 25% off. All of the copies of Catholics in Exile I have personally signed. I can also sign other ones too. But I wanted to mention the book once again that he mentioned. This just came out a few days ago. It's called Breaking the Bread, a Biblical Devotional for Catholics, and it's set for Advent. I wrote this with Ken O'Gorick, and we basically connect all of the Old and New Testament readings for all of the Sundays of the coming year. So if you're thinking of family or friends or Christmas for that matter, you might consider these things too. Again, enjoy the evening. <laughs>